Uh, if a fellow was looking for a new church, does anyone know a good one? here in an undisclosed location in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm here with Brad, my uh, shape-shifting vision casting leader. So guess that 90s hairband from the intro and you'll win a prize. Tell them what they'll win, Brad. Double Dragon 2, the revenge for your Nintendo entertainment system. If you missed the 90s hairband from the uh, prevailing theology of Hillsong Church video, here it is. It was the band uh, Dokken. What a <laughs> what a beautiful looking bunch of men. <laughs> In the nineties, it was like you wanted to see how much like a woman you can make yourself look. It was a crazy time, crazy time, kids. So today we're going to be looking at uh, Paula White. She's a word of faith uh, prosperity heretic. And all you have to do to really know that is to listen to her for about five minutes uh, anytime she says anything. They really can't talk about anything else, the uh, prosperity heretics. Everything they say, every time they talk, it's going to be about prosperity. But people listen to them because they think, hey, they're, they're, they're using the Bible. And they do use the Bible. Well, well, they use verses in the Bible. They grab one from here and one from here, and then they kind of create a theology. They cobble together a theology. Kind of like what uh, Peter wrote in um, 2 Peter 3.16. Uh, Peter, writing of, of Paul's writing, he writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. Uh, they kind of rearrange, they mess with it as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, here Paul is going to be uh, distorting uh, some of the writings of Paul. <clears throat> so this is Paul of the White versus Paul the Apostle. But first, let's, uh, let's do another edition of um, story time with uh, Uncle Bill Johnson. What do you say? You want to hear stories? No, you don't want to hear stories. <laughs> Uh, we got to read some scripture to make this legal. I'm already accused of being a cult leader. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta at least use the Bible. How many of you have heard about the Roadrunner story? Okay, well that helps. That's how many don't know what I'm talking about, but you would really like for me to tell you. Oh, okay, I will. We, you know, when this first started happening to us, it was embarrassing, actually. Um, this was quite a few years ago. Before we had this wing, the Emerald Johnson wing over here with the Hebrews Coffee Shop and Bookstore, before we had the prayer house, we'd have our, our Friday night meetings, Sunday night meetings. Back in the dining room, which is right behind the stage, we'd have our pre-service prayer meetings. And uh, I remember going one Friday night. Uh, I went about 15 or 20 minutes early, and I'm walking around the prayer room and just praying uh, pre-service prayer for the pre-service prayer. Pre, pre, pre. And a roadrunner came right up to the, there's a glass wall of windows and doors, and a roadrunner comes right up to the window. Now, you know, maybe you've seen roadrunners all your life. I've lived in Reading f since 1968. I've never seen or heard of one in my life around here. And here's a roadrunner comes right up to the window, and he's dancing, trying to get in, into the window. He's hitting the glass and going back. He's got this huge lizard in his mouth. And I'm, I'm like three feet away from it going, this is too weird to not be prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. I thought this, this is too weird to not be prophetic. God, what are you saying to me? Expecting him to speak something to me. Nothing. So, uh, well, it is weird anyway. So I walked around and prayed. Finally, he took off. And a little, a little bit later, uh, Don came in from our school. And Don Mayer, and, and uh, he came in. And he was in there with me. And we were walking around. And the roadrunner came back. And, and Don goes, oh, he's back. And I said, what do you mean back? He says, yeah, he was here last Friday night. I went, you're kidding. Roadrunner? He comes to prayer meetings? And sure enough, I can hardly wait till the next week. The third week, he's back again. 
And he would only come to prayer meetings. He wouldn't come to hear us preach or anything. He would, but he'd come to prayer meetings. And he'd come to that room back there. And he'd almost always have this big lizard in his mouth. And he would dance at the window trying to get in. And uh, finally, Banning came to me once. They started having their youth uh, uh, Wednesday night pre-service prayer meeting in that room. And the roadrunner joined them for the prayer meeting. So he didn't mind if his old people or young people praying. He just wanted to come when they were praying. So, so I'm, I'm calling all these prophets that we know. And I'm talking to the intercessors. And I'm basically telling them, you know, really don't spread this around. We're already looked at kind of weird for what's happening around here. And I really don't want anyone to know we, we got a thing going on with a roadrunner. But... <clears throat> If you hear anything from the Lord, you know, help us out, that kind of a deal. And so I'm talking to these prophets and intercessors, and, and it was just, it was this ongoing, ongoing thing. It was really strange. In fact, when we started building the prayer house, this went on for months, only come to prayer meetings. In fact, I was in there on a Sunday morning, and I was teaching a class on signs and wonders. And there came one particular morning, and we used to have one service. Actually, we had two, and then we reduced it to one, because we had the room. And then we went back to two. <laughs> Sorry, my humor is not coming across very well. But before the service, we had classes, and so I was teaching a class on signs and wonders. And I happened to be up that Sunday morning, and I started talking about signs that make you wonder, unusual experiences. Right on cue, the roadrunner shows up. And I didn't, my back is to the wall of windows, and that guy sitting in the front row goes, you mean him? And I turned around and went, yeah, yeah, the roadrunner. And so he's standing at the door, he's got his, you know, his lizard, and one time he chased off some blackbirds and got a big worm, and it was just entertaining to watch what he would do. So when we started building the prayer house, we have, if you've been in the prayer house, uh, please make sure you go in the prayer house, pray. If you go in the prayer house, on the far side, there's this huge rock. And if you look at the rock a certain way, it almost looks like an eagle's head. There's an interesting beak, everything. And this roadrunner would go sit on top of that rock and watch them build the prayer house. And then I found out, somebody did, we, we had all kinds of people sending, sending uh, research papers on roadrunners. They're related to the eagle. Who would have thought of that? You know why I like them? They hate and eat rattlesnakes. Any animal that eats rattlesnakes is my best friend. I mean, they just, they dance in front of the thing till it strikes, they move out of the way, peck it on the back of the head, and they'll walk around for days with a snake just hanging out of its mouth, you know, until they just digest the whole thing. I, I would show you, but you wouldn't want it. So this went on, this went on for months. He'd go over to the prayer house, and he stopped coming to our prayer meetings. He would just hang out over the prayer house while it was being built. One day, he got into the building. And he was upstairs. How he got upstairs, we don't know. Jason, our janitor at the time, now world-traveling evangelist or prophet, I should say, Jason was up vacuuming cleaning, and the roadrunner's there. And Jason's basically the St. Francis of Assisi at, at that moment in time. And, and uh, so he, the, the roadrunner would go stand in the windowsill and look like he wanted to go out. And Jason would turn on some worship music, sit in the middle of the floor, and that, that bird would come perched right in front of him while he just worshiped. I'm not saying the bird cupped his wings. <laughs> I'm not saying he fell back, you know, like that. I'm not, I'm not saying any of that. I'm just, I'm just saying he would just sit right in front of Jason while, they, while he would worship. And then he'd feel bad about not working, so he'd go back to vacuum some more, and then he'd get curious about what would happen. He'd sit back down, turn the stereo back up, and he'd worship, and the bird would come right back again, right in front of him. This went on and on through, throughout the evening. Finally, he finishes the room. And he, he, he goes down the stairway, because he has other rooms to clean, and the, the roadrunner goes right with him. So they're walking down this wide old hall over here, walking down the hall, and... Uh, Unknown to him, there was somebody in another room, a classroom. And they opened the classroom door behind him, startled the bird. The roadrunner flew to the end of the hall into a plate glass window and died. Yeah, I'm sorry. It just did. It's just, just, I know you're best friends with this thing now, but it, it just died. So Jason comes to get me. He's got the bird in the back under a little box. And he, and he says, <laughs> he says, I killed the roadrunner. I said, what happened? And he told me the story. I said, well, where is he? So I figured we'd just go raise him from the dead. So he says, he's back here. So we go back there and I put my two fingers on his head. <laughs> Commanded a life. I know you're, you're hoping it ends well. It, it, he just stayed dead. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's weird. It's weird to have something like that in your life for months as a reminder of what God was doing. For months and then have it dead. And so I went to my office, I said, God, what's this all about? Because I'm thinking, it'd be a really cool ending to have this generation of the dead. I could get a real good prophecy out of that somehow. I could interpret it some way. Nothing. I said, Lord, what's going on? And he spoke so clearly to me. He said, what I'm bringing into the house had better have a way of being released from the house or it will die in the house. Meep, meep. And what we recognize is that we certainly, I don't believe, 
This is the absolute end. I believe there is a great, great awakening, a great revival, a great harvest of souls coming in that God has raised you up and positioned you for such a time as this. However, the detriment would be to die in the wilderness, to have a mindset like you've just come out of captivity, out of Egypt, but Egypt has not come out of you. I've heard that before, something about coming out of Egypt in the Bible. Was it, um, well, let's, let's look and see. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So Paul is saying if you don't, you know, wake up and get into that position, whatever and wherever that is, you're, you're going to die in the wilderness. But Paul said that was written as an example to us that we might not sin. <clears throat> and uh, it's interesting because Paul uses the example of what happened with the golden calf. Now, now you know what happened with the golden calf. God told the children of Israel to sit and uh, wait for it. It was pretty clear, specific instructions. You guys sit here and wait for me. Well, the Bible says they got tired of waiting. Uh, maybe they had a preacher who was telling them, y'all need to wake up and get into position. You can't just sit around here all day. You got to get up or you got to play. See, that's what Paul says. <clears throat> uh, that's Paul, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the apostle. So today I want to talk to you about changing the narrative, a paradigm shift, that you are the wave of influence. Just call me daddy. If you could just elbow somebody, I know we are socially distancing everything, but just look at somebody and let them know you are the wave of influence. Hey, Brad. No can do. So let's get into the word. First off, welcome to the world of change. Everything has changed. Absolutely everything. At an accelerated rate, change in economics, change in our society, change in culture and technology, change in the political landscape, change in the spiritual realm. Change in the spiritual realm. What does that mean? When God has changed, what does that statement mean? It doesn't matter with charismatics. Meaning doesn't matter to them. It, it, it really doesn't. To ride these tides of change, to understand what is God up to and how do I fit in? God, what are you doing? Show me. To ride these tides of change, we have to have a very clear apostolic kingdom strategy and a paradigm shift. Do we? Do we have to have that? An apostolic kingdom strategy and a paradigm shift. The, the Apostle Paul, who was an actual apostle, never told us that. Well, were, were, were things not um, changing in Paul's day? They were, you know. The things have been changing since, well, since, since the beginning of time. They will help us with our objective action plans to build for not only the future movement and generations, but to act absolutely not miss our moment right now god is up to something unprecedented oh god is up to something he, he's up there scheming uh, he's a schemer uh, god is and he's doing it across the world for the bible says in habakkuk chapter 2 verse 14 that the glory of the knowledge of the lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea now paul the apostle had something to say about that Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully. 
So one way you don't fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of God is to handle the word of God deceitfully. Also, you don't engage in word saladry. <laughs> That's a phrase I coined. Not the phrase word salad, but word saladry. Uh, that's mine, I think. Well, probably not. Nobody comes with it. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ filling the earth. That's what Paul the Apostle says. Now let's hear what Paul of the White says. God's glory and the knowledge of who he is is going to cover this earth and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God. That's Revelation 11, 5. And <clears throat> the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. That's very important given what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. You really need Christ in there. But Paul of the White doesn't talk much about Christ. Paul the Apostle does, but not Paul of the White. You see, God is doing something new, and the Bible says in Mark chapter 2, verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed. And so were the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. So God says, I'm pouring out a new, fresh anointing. No, he doesn't. He has done that already. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. So what is Jesus talking about here? The question is about fasting and prayer. It's a question. Did the, did the disciples pray while Jesus was with them? Why would they? They had no need to pray. God was literally with them, eating with them, walking with them, talking with them. But a time would come when, Je a time would, come when Jesus would leave and they would have to pray. This is why Jesus devotes much of the latter part of his ministry to his disciples, teaching them how to pray in his absence, how to operate in his abs absence. This is what he's talking about. The, uh, the bridegroom is here, but the bridegroom will soon be gone. How will the bride act when he is gone? How will she talk to her husband? Through the Holy Spirit. God poured out the Holy Spirit upon his bride at Pentecost. And this happens every time a sinner is made a bride of Christ. This is the seal of promise that we will be married to our bridegroom. But that's not what Paula is talking about. She's talking about something newer than the Holy Spirit. It's the new and improved Holy Spirit, I guess. And this is what Paul is saying. They came and asked Jesus why his disciples don't fast. And Jesus said, look, boys, in uh, 2020, this place called America, there's, there's going to be a pandemic. And these two cats named Trump and Biden running for president. And there's going to be civil unrest and stuff. And God is going to be up to something like new wine. Yeah, that's dumb. It's dumb, Paula. I'm sorry, but it's dumb. There's a reformation happening. A revival, an awakening, a restoration back to the original condition. Now, according to what Jesus is, is teaching here, um, our original condition was, was old, useless uh, wineskins. Uh, the Holy Spirit regenerates us. 
uh, from sinners into the pure and spotless bride of Christ. Uh, are, uh, is God going to take us back um, to our original condition of being um, sinners, um, soiled, un, un, unfit to be married to Christ? But it cannot be put in old structures. In other words, there must be a better quality of skin that is developed to receive what is going to be poured out. No, that's not what Jesus was talking about. We, we just read the text. <clears throat> I, I guess what Paul is saying is we've got to make ourselves ready or God won't give us his Holy Spirit. We, we've got to regenerate ourselves. Now, Paul the Apostle said the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our marriage to Christ, Ephesians 1.13. So I guess what Paul the White is saying is, is Christ is telling his bride, I'm not going to marry you until you clean yourself up. Get yourself together and I'll promise to marry you. Has Paul of the White ever read the Bible? Uh, I don't think so. Because the glory of the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth, even as the waters cover the sea. See, the Lord was saying, if the new goes into the old, you will lose both the old and the new. That's not what the Lord was saying. If we were reading the text, we'd know that, but we're not reading the text. Paul doesn't feel the need to have the congregation read the text of the words that came from our Lord's mouth. Uh, you don't worry about what the Bible says. I'll tell you what he said. I'll tell you what it means. So we must preserve what has gotten us to this point. We have to look back, just like God told Israel, put these memorials, put these stones. Don't forget where I brought you from. So I guess she's referring to Joshua 4, when God parted the Jordan River so that his children could cross it and destroy Jericho and take over the promised land. If we were reading it, we, we'd know that. But Paul, Paul the White, she doesn't feel the need to read God's word or to have her congregation read it. Uh, that's the level of contempt she has for God's word and for her congregation. So while we look back to know what God has done and we understand history as it pertains to our Christianity, as it pertains to us as believers, we also have to look ahead prophetically with the lens of God's spirit and say, what are you doing right now? No, no, what verse is that? I'm, uh, I'm asking for a friend. I mean, I mean, where did God say that in his word? May God open your eyes. May every scale be removed. May blindness and spiritual darkness fall off. May God awaken you spiritually right now and the anointing touch you. Scales fall from your eyes. I guess that's in reference to what happened to Paul when his eyes were open to the truth of the gospel. That's what the Bible talks about, our eyes being open to the truth of the gospel, not open to what God is doing at any particular moment or time. It's, um, it's none of our business, frankly. Uh, Paul says this in Romans 8. God move mightily, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit right now. That's um, Zechariah 4, 6. It's the prophecy of, uh, you guessed it, Jesus. Uh, a mighty king who would come and fill the whole earth with the knowledge of God and the glory of God. Sweep across every congregate member, every person that is watching this in their home, in their living room, on their mobile phone, wherever they are. Let the spirit of the Lord take up presence. Let his power be manifest in your life today in Jesus' mighty name. That's all Jesus is to Paul the White, just a punctuation to put at the end of her own sentences, her own uh, declarations. That's all. We must discern and develop the new quality structure in order to hold the revelation that will unveil the glory of the future. There has to be a paradigm shift. So are you still in Zechariah 4 or what? <laughs> Where are you in God's word, Paula? Where are you in the book God wrote? We're trying to read along with the things God said to us. We're, we're not that concerned about what you had to say to us. Um, Paula the White, no offense, but we're not. You see, we are a people and a church who've been called to steer the course of history. You're it, you're the wave of influence because the church is the only legal entity in the earth that is authorized by God. Now with that said, the church must have their hand on the pulse of what is God doing. So, so, so what, what text is that from? We will, we will steer the course of history with our deep rooted faith, with the word of God, with prayers and intercession with our worship, and by the Holy Spirit. Will we? We'll steer the course of history with the Word of God, but, but we won't read it. No, we don't need to read it. We've got Paul the White here to lead us. You see, I believe God is doing something significant through your life, that you are an image bearer, and you are a cultural creator. 
As a child of God, you are the new wave of influence. We bear the image of Christ. This is what Paul the Apostle said in Romans 8, 29. But Paul the White isn't talking about Christ. What's she talking about? I don't know. She, she's, she's talking the black speech of Mordor, I think. And if you understand your purpose, your position, and your assignment, then the body of Christ will fulfill the will of what God has. Now, I do understand. God told it to me pretty plainly, and he didn't say it in Elvish or the black speech of Mordor either. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. If we miss this moment, and if you miss your moment, and try to be the church of yesterday, you will literally die in the wilderness. Literally, you will literally die in the wilderness. If you discern what God is doing, you'll move into the promised land and you will take possession in the name of Jesus. I declare you will not miss this moment in Jesus' name. So if we don't straighten up and figure out what God's doing, we'll get left behind? Uh, that's, that's what she's saying. That's what Paul of the White is saying. Paul the, Apostle said, uh, Paul the Apostle said we need to keep ourselves pure from sin. He said that's what the Exodus was all about. And that is what the Holy Spirit does to us and in us, helps us to fight sin. This is what Romans 8 is about. But that's not what Paul of the White is about. What is she about? Who knows? Just, just send her some money. We are called to stand in both the sacred and the secular to publish the living word of God. You see, you are his living epistle. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink but by the spirit of the living god not on tablets of stone but on tablets of flesh that's second corinthians 3. so paul is saying they are their letters of commendation their bona fides as it were well, we are not the incarnate word of god that would be jesus jesus is more than just a punctuation to put at the end of our sentences he is in fact the whole of the word of god the whole of every word the whole of every sentence in which you are written by the hand of God, not as a letter of man, but as a letter of the living God. God wants to use your life to publish his word, to decree a thing, to declare a thing, and to establish many things. No, to show the world a proper image of his son, a proper reflection of his holiness, his righteousness. Not many things, just that one thing. That's what Paul the Apostle said. That's not what Paul of the White is saying, though. You see, our challenge becomes this, to break off the desires of our own hearts, that which can skew the voice of the Lord that is coming through us, and to declare the word of the Lord. Why? Because we have these paradigms, we have these thoughts, we have these perceptions of how God works or what God's doing, but you cannot put God in a box. Now, I don't know what Paul the White is uh, getting at here, but this is what Paul the Apostle said. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We can't decree and declare things because we don't know what to decree and declare. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Would be the Holy Spirit. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He, the Holy Spirit, is making God's purpose happen here on the earth. And what is his purpose? To make us into the image of his son so that we might be a true and proper reflection of him. That is why we need to know about him. That is why all the apostles wrote letters filled with information about him. But that's not what Paul the White is about. She's not talking about it. Why is that, do you think? You see, when we say declare the word of the Lord, the biblical phrase is extremely important. 
because it in indicates the highest thoughts and the predetermined will of God. Uh, Paul the Apostle says those are contained in the Word of God, but we're not hearing the Word of God here or the words of Paul the Apostle, which are the words of God, Christ having chosen Paul the Apostle to speak for him. We are hearing the words of Paula the White. Did Christ choose Paula the White to speak for him? For him? And if so, why is she not speaking of him? Because in the Bible, the people Jesus chose to speak for him spoke of him all the time. <clears throat> what have we heard about him from Paula the White? Nothing. Just, you know, in Jesus' name at the end of her declarations. Jesus is her punchline, her sidekick. That, that's who Jesus is to her. Okay, well, that's enough. I, I can't take any more. Just, just stay away from Paula White. That's, uh, that's all I know to tell you. So, yes. Conrad, how important is expository preaching? It's vital. It's vital primarily because what tends to happen if you are not an expository preacher is that you are constantly going to the Bible with your own thoughts and finding a passage of scripture that you can simply use as a peg in order for you to, to share what you already want to share. And as a result, you are not really beginning with God and what God himself already wants to communicate to his people so that all you're doing is running with his word. Uh, Exposure preaching enables you to, to begin with God. You are going to his word and by expository preaching I have in mind consecutive expository preaching where you are either going through large sections of books of the Bible or making your way through an entire book. It, it also disciplines you as a preacher because then you become a consistent student mm -hmm. uh, instead of always depending on passages that you already know very well and um, consequently you become stale mm -hmm. but as an expository preacher you you are constantly in the word you are reading you making your way around uh, classic commentaries um, including the best that are currently available coming uh, through conservative um, evangelical uh, commentators so all that enables you to as it were cook a good meal mm -hmm. a healthy meal for the people of God in an ongoing way